Hello and welcome to another episode of the CEO Pick. I am Dave Osh, your host today. And with me today is Ryan Prosser. He is the CEO at Very. Very is a fully distributed IoT engineering company partnering with clients to build systems for smart manufacturing, consumer electronics, and connected wellness. So Ryan loves building awesome teams, growing companies, racing mountain bikes, reading presidential bios, and being with his family, he's not sure about the order. I saw Ryan for the first time on another show uh, two weeks back, and I was really impressed with the way that he actually led change in a company. And this is the reason I invited him to the show. And we found out just in a prep call that our path crossed in a in the past when we were living in 2007 to 2010 in Hong Kong at the same time. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Great, thanks for having me. Yeah, and, and you know, the topic that we, you actually discussed on the other show a few weeks back was about creating a common language in the company. So, but before we get there, if you just give a little bit of a business background and about yourself and about Vary to give a little bit color and context for the interview and we'll do it pretty briefly before we move to the topic. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, uh, I, I graduated college uh, back in the long now forgotten recession of the what they called dot com boom at that time. Uh, but it feels long forgotten in the lens of the last two that we've had, um, but have worked hard to build a career in in tech um, and have been you know fortunate enough to be a part of some successes over the years. And, and like you said, um, life took me overseas for a number of years. I lived in. Um, uh, among other places, Hong Kong. It's where I met my wife, and uh, yeah, I've been with Very for um, for about four years now. And the uh, you know was drawn to the idea of a remote company because I really wanted to get to Montana. It was kind of a long term dream for myself. Not a ton of uh, job opportunities out here, um, at least in in the you know for what I was interested in doing. And, and so the idea of remote uh, was very new to me at that time, a totally remote company. But here I am four years later, uh, looking, you know, accidentally smart through the lens of COVID where everybody's remote now. We got a little bit of a head start, but like, honestly, uh, just got pretty lucky on that. Can you share? I, I love the story that you mentioned about how you led to change language within the company. I, I think that it's pretty cool because... You know, so many people are afraid of culture, but culture is a big, big thing in organization. And sometimes you just start with a small step and it leads you to another step. So if you don't mind to share the story that you shared before. Yeah. So, you know, this was, um, I don't know, feels like maybe a, a, uh, some folks out there in TV land might feel like this is a bit of a dry topic, but um, it, it I felt there's more meat to it than meets the eye. And we... Um, we were struggling to attract and retain. We, we were a very male dominated company, you know, we're IOT companies. So our, our customer base um, skews very male, um, you know, typically 45 and older um, manager and above in a large commercial uh, engineering company. And, and so our, you know, the types of people we hire um, up to a point really reflected that. And we wanted, we knew our thesis was that having, you know, a diverse work place um, was going to yield benefits that would make the company better, that would make the individual contributors better. And we just weren't seeing female candidates, um, you know, become interested. And then as we started to, to build up a base of uh, really talented um, uh, folks internally, uh, some of the, there was a bit of discomfort, I think, uh, on like the language that had um, like language in the workplace as it had evolved organically. And I own a huge piece of that failing. You know, I definitely uh, cuss like a sailor, which it, ironically I inherited from my mother. And, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know, I think we don't want to feel cheated out of any language, any uh, words in the English language. We like to use all of them. And, but over time, um, 
there was like a bit of discomfort that uh cert, you know some of our female employees uh felt like the language was not inclusive it did not create a workplace that made them feel included like they had a a, a long-term home and a Upon like closer inspection, you could see where someone would feel that way, and um, and so we took a we took a look like we do with everything. Uh, we, we took like an engineering focused approach to, okay, how can we um, how can we tackle this? You know, and the, the we came up with and what I like is not being prescriptive. I like to pr to provide you know really good people with guide uh, with what I call like guardrails. Um, and then just let them interpret as they see fit, um, which you know, obviously requires that we lean heavily on our hiring funnel to hire great people in the first place. But, you know, it came down to things like, you know, talk like your mother is in the room. Um, and we went back and forth about, you know, should we say talk like the Queen of England is in the room? It felt a bit formal, you know, talk like uh, Michelle Obama or Nancy Reagan is in the room, but like politics in 2020 felt like a mistake. So you said, you know, speak like your mother's in the room. Um, you know, assume that the other person, the, the second one was assume the other person wants to get better. So if you hear something, say something that was fairly controversial. Uh, people felt like that put the quote unquote victim, uh, in the position of having to like be the police officer. Um, and then the third one was, um, uh, you know, no, no body parts or anything of a sexually suggestive nature. And, and those three guardrails have been a huge win for us. Um, and I think they've, they've led to a pretty, um, uh, as far as language goes, large transformation at very, and, uh, yeah, so we're proud of it. We've been sharing that as like a thing that you can do. This is not like a huge revolution, but we've felt, um, you know, we've felt like we, we've viewed a problem with our eyes wide open. And, and came at it with a solution that you know wasn't overly heavy-handed yeah you know i i'm thinking while you're talking about this change that you say well it's looks like it's just a simple change right you change language you remove some kind of a curse and other type of and uh, but you actually looked into diversity from a different angle because many, when, when you see male dominated companies, you think, oh, they, we don't have the skill sets or we don't have, you look at the external and you don't look at the internal. And the beauty in the process is that you look, hey, how do we be, how can we be more diverse in a language that we, we talk in a company, right? That it will fit all, everybody. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. you change. Well, what was the impact of this change on diversity? Do you see any change that happened after? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and I, I think not not only um, you know I think that the number of, of female colleagues that we've been able to add since then you know has grown substantially. If if that's a metric of success, but I think a probably a better metric of success is just general uh, employee sentiment. You know, and like how how often um, are we seeing issues like this flagged peer to peer, and um, you know, we're scaling quickly. We're a services business that's growing 50% year over year. That might seem, uh, that might seem low for a SaaS company, but you know, that's a, that's blistering for a services company. And so we're growing quickly. Um, and we're, you know, it, it, the, the feedback we're getting is that this, uh, provides, you know, very fair, equal, inclusive footing for everyone to come in and be able to like, you know, continue to communicate colorfully and in ways that is that are diverse, but understand, especially as we're adding people from, you know, different countries and maybe have different backgrounds and cultures, maybe their grasp of English is not um, as perfect as a native English speaker. And so they really don't want to say anything offensive inadvertently. So, you know, it's been, as we've become larger, more multicultural, uh, I guess, multinational, it's been like a very simple framework that allows people to communicate, make new friends, uh, collaborate across the company and not worry that they're inadvertently, um, you know, crossing a line. Do you feel that actually working and make this kind of a simple change, as you describe it, but with a larger impact, a wider impact on diversity, inclusiveness, when you are, I understand that you're running the company remotely, right? You have a fully distributed workforce. Yes. 
What was the impact there? Did, it, did you find it more difficult to make a change or more easy? Uh, how did it work and how actually you brought those employees from different countries, different cultures together to make that change? Well, yeah, um, you know, pros and cons. So, you know, I, I don't envy CEOs that have to run companies that are um, only partially remote. Uh, it I, I I get that it's inevitable at a certain um, at a certain size, but it, it isn't ob obvious to me how um, you enforce certain things when you have different constituent groups based in different places. Um, it, it seems like that continuity would be difficult. So we're advantaged in that we're totally remote. Everybody is is operating, um, you know, from like a common footing. Uh, we have time zone alignment, so we're not spread across the globe. Everyone is in the Americas. And, you know, so that, that I had, I had advantages there in that, uh, everyone is, you know, we, everyone has what we call a battle station. So the company pays for them to have a world-class operating station in their home, um, to work from. So from like a technology and a workspace perspective, everyone's coming at this from the same place. They're remote, they're dealing with each other remotely. Many employees have never met a single other employee in person. So, you know, we're dealing primarily virtually. Um, and so, you know, you lose a lot of the nonverbal cues um, that come with in-person communication. And so we have to be very, very strong um, in how we communicate virtually. And Very has worked extremely hard over the years to be what we would consider ourselves to be the most effective remote company in the world. So getting language in the workplace right is really important for us. Maybe it wouldn't be for, for someone else. Um, the you know some of the things that were more difficult um not everyone at very has worked in a remote setting before not everyone at very um has worked in a company that takes diversity and inclusion seriously you know maybe they like had an initiative or gave lip service to it but you know not everyone has been in a place where it was legitimately um i think valued and and so they were able to just sort of like can communicate with their peers like they might communicate with their friends at a bar. And we're trying to draw a line there and say, this is a professional workplace. Um, you know, that's why we invest in your workspace so that it feels like an office to you and creating that, uh, you know, creating that space went part of the way. But again, these guardrails, um, you know, unfortunately, like it wasn't obvious to everyone where the lines are and, and we had these continued issues and really good intentioned people, um, you know, crossing some lines that upon closer examination, anybody would say, yeah, that's, you can't say that, you know, that's on the wrong side of the line. But the line for somebody who lives in, you know, for a hardware engineer in St. Louis, Missouri might be totally different for, um, you know, a marketer who lives in Florida, for example, they just may view the workplace and, and language in the workplace differently. So we, we've had to bring this together and commonize that. Engineers are very comfortable with the idea of standard, like creating common standards. And so extending that from the engineering world to uh, the personal, you know, interpersonal communications is not as big of a leap as it feels like, especially when, like I said, everybody is, is coming at it from like, we are all remote. It's not like some people are, are you know, uh, you're dialing into a happy hour or, and they might be, you know, uh, the behavioral standards that in the conference room you're dialing into might be very different than you would uh, consider normal in your home workstation. How people hold you accountable when you are off the track? How do they? How does it feel? And how does it work? I have. I'm. I'm very lucky um, or fortunate that I have an executive team that I've invested really heavily in, um, and they. Um, I think they believe strongly in the mission of what we're trying to build. We refer to Vary as the grand experiment. And, uh, you know, there are, there are a half a dozen components to, to Vary that make us uh, unique and different in some ways that are extremely compelling. And if any of them are not true, then it, it becomes a lot less interesting place to be. And so, um, so I've got, you know, executives that I have a few executives that have been at this company longer than I have. And so they've seen the turnaround, you know, they've been on the ship as it has totally turned around. And so I think for them, um, they're very proud 
of the work that we've put in and they hold me to the standard that, uh, you know, I purport to be holding all of everyone else to. And, and, but then there's the new executives and they're really interesting because almost no one believes that we are legitimately what we claim to be at first. You know, I just, Mm -hmm. it, and, and so I think they, they're looking under the hood, waiting for that aha moment where some of these initiatives are revealed to be uh, just kind of like outward facing, uh, you know, publicity grabs or something. Like we're not actually, mm-hmm. when, the, when it going gets tough, we're not actually doing these things. A PR game. Right, exactly. And, and it very, like I pride myself deeply in being authentic and, and only saying things that I feel strongly and, and then, you know, back up with, with actions. And, um, you know, that's, that's important to me. And so as people come in and validate that these things are true, working at very starts to become, uh, you know, like they derive a deep sense of purpose from being here, that we're doing the things that we, um, that we talk about. And it, and when times are, are tough and times were tough earlier this year. You know, March was very scary for our customers, which meant it was very scary for us. And there was opportunities for us to, you know, that that was happening. March and COVID was occurring at immediately after this language in the workplace thing. And it would have been very easy to say, okay, some of these like touchy feely initiatives, we're gonna put those on the shelf because it doesn't matter right now. That stuff doesn't matter right now. It matters later. But if it's important enough to do, it's important enough to do no matter how hard hard the times get either you are either committed to doing the hard right thing or you're not. And, um, over and over at very, we've committed ourselves to, to picking the things that we do and then doing them fully and completely. So you just mentioned heavily invested in the executive team. So what did you mean by heavily invested? Every executive on my team, um, we have a, a three to five year arc for them. Um, and most and, and then that's mapping to like the big question, uh, like anybody who knows me personally, um, even like a little bit, like you've sat next to me on an airplane a little bit, knows that um, I will quickly want to unpack with you. What is it that you are doing with your life? You know, like what what is this all mapping to for you? And it doesn't have to be like professional goals, but like, the, you know, what? How much, like the answer to questions, when the answer is more, you know, I tell people more is not an answer. A promotion is not a goal. A promotion is a, a, you know, like what is it that you really want to do with your life? And there are thought exercises you can go through. that will help like reveal this. Like if you, if you suddenly found yourself on your deathbed, you knew you only had five minutes left to live. What are, what are the things that you would regret that you didn't, like you're sitting there is saying, I can't believe I never did this. I can't believe I was never able to, you know, what, and what do those things look like? And, um, you know, you can go through, and then there's like various other ones to unpack, like professionally, what, what is it that you want to spend your time on earth becoming excellent at and doing, you know, and wh- those are hard questions to answer. People go their whole lives, like trying to avoid answering them because they're so hard to answer. There's, and then people, you know, it, it becomes discouraging. You don't have a great answer, but you can get there. A person can get there. If they really want to answer those questions, they, they can, and th- they need it. They need someone that cares about them enough to help guide them on that journey. Once you have those a- answered, you know, you can start to back into, you know, a, a five-year plan or a three-year plan that has actual goals that are more than I want to be at this promotion level. But it's like, you know, what are the things that you want to develop as a, as a professional? What are the things that are important to you? And I, you know, I think most people go their whole life without really going through this process. You know, I force every one of my executives to go through it and it's hard and it's fun and it's very validating. Um, and it's, it's galvanized our team. I mean, our team, our, our executive team is extremely strong and dedicated and filled with purpose and, you know, and we, you know, we all get along well and there's no secrets and, and we're all very transparent about where each person is trying to go and not each person's very few of my executive team's long-term path has them staying at very forever or for any long period of time. At some point we will lose them and that's okay, you know, but we'll get the best out of them while we've got them. And then, you know, their journey is going to take them on to the next thing. It's, it's about the time that you as a CEO, invest in a team to work with them 
not just as the CEO, but let's say like a coach, right? Working on their purpose and vision. And uh, I learned to working with leadership team that it, I, I, I must start with a purpose. I used to not to start with there and starting with the external environment and so on. And I found that if you are grounded in purpose, everything else is just fall, fall in place. It falls in place without any explanation at all. And and you as a CEO, it's a, it's like wearing a different hat of coaching your team, working not in the team, but working on the team individually and collectively. And it's a beautiful process. You know what? Earlier you talk about the language and how you change the language and the diversity, the diversity and inclusiveness. I also thought about how language actually changes also the way that the underlying beliefs, it, it looks like you change the, the language, so it changed the words, but the words reflect on your assumptions, your belief system, right? You know, I can't, I should. So it's when you start to deal with language in the company, you find that you are expanding it beyond just the removing some words from the language. So it's a beautiful process. Mm -hmm. So before we wrap it up, uh, Ryan, Anything that you like to share that influenced you, a book, uh, somebody, a mentor that helped you to ground yourself in such a in type of leadership that not too many CEOs actually embark into. So what was your influence? You know, I really love systems. I love um, I love systems. I love organizations and I love. Um, Gardening feels too small. I, I live here, you know, on a, a small farm in in Montana. I, I love um, the closed loop system of a of a of a properly running farm, you know, with the compost mm -hmm. and the animals and one thing, uh, you know, provides the uh, is a part of the cycle for another thing. And if, if these things are all running correctly you need very few outside inputs and you see that with um with 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 organizations you know unhealthy organizations um i was very happy for example to leave the venture backed world the the vc venture backed world and i get why they need outside influence uh or outside cash to um you know to be able to like quickly scale and so but i didn't like it you know i thought it, it introduced a lot of unsustainable elements into business i i love uh, organizations that are self-sufficient and um, and and like efficient. I love efficiency, and efficiency is such like a nerdy word. You know, you say it, people immediately think of like some kind of bean counter trying to squeeze, you know, a penny out of something. But you know, if you're really doing it right, you're finding you're building these like self-reinforcing systems. And as I've built out. Uh, this executive team. And that's really the only thing I've done. Everything else at Very, you know, we've won in our world, we've won every award you can win and set, you know, many of them several times, but I haven't won anything. You know, nobody's given me a CEO of the year. Or I've, I personally have won zero, but, but the people that I have nurtured have built things that have won awards. And I take tremendous pride in that because it's, it's that same like sense of system um, and I'm investing heavily in them, getting a lot out of them, making sure that we have the correct people. Um, you know, you asked about investing in our team. I don't invest in the wrong people. I won't do it. And that's a big, I think a thing we didn't talk about much today is like, uh, very few people are, um, like we say, you can't send a duck to Eagle school. And that really is not a knock, knock on ducks. And nor is it like meant to build the eagles up, but like you cannot send, uh, I think ducks are fantastic, but like ducks go to duck school. And and for what we're trying to do, I need a certain type of leader. And and so uh, we've been very good at like selecting, we say that we're the world's best place for square pegs. We say that all the time. Circle pegs are fantastic. The world's needs circle pegs. We are the world's best place for square pegs. We're great at identifying them for every type of role. And then once we find them, we invest heavily in them. But that's a part of the closed loop system. You have to have the right pieces in the right places. And um, yeah, so as far as like a book that I read, um, 
the bookshelf behind me is filled with like sustainable farm books. I, I love the idea of like self-sustaining systems. And, um, and I think it is strange as it may seem it like it, it has huge, uh, uh, parallels with building businesses, in my opinion. We live in an ecosystem, right? Both as a farm in a farm in nature and both as a company. So, and I, maybe it's not just a coincidence that you ended up to work on diversity while you're actually looking into sustainability. So it's a beautiful process. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much uh, for being with thank us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time and uh, thank you for watching the show and I'm looking forward uh, to see you in the next episode next week and uh, see you, bye-bye.